This is WOR New York. Stay tuned for In Conversation. First, this bulletin from the WOR newsroom. Six members of one family have been found shot to death in their night clothes in their expensive home in Amityville, Long Island. The only available information at this moment, according to the Amityville Village Police, is that the, mem- the victims have been identified as members of the DeFeo family. They were found by a 23-year-old son, Ronald DeFeo, who is believed to be the only surviving member of the family. Six members of the family found shot to death in their home in Amityville, Long Island. We will have further details on the 11 o'clock news. This was the first radio broadcast to announce the murders which would in no time at all become infamous across the world. The Amityville murders committed by Ronald DeFeo Jr. The entire DeFeo family was shot in their sleep by son and brother Ronald. This atrocity would spark the beginning of a modern day bloody legend. A legend which has been adopted and adapted in the grotesquely fantastical creations of 15 Amityville films. Ronald initially claimed that the murders were conducted by a mob hitman, whom he named. However, this story was soon proved inconsistent, since the supposed hitman was out of the state of New York at the time of the murders. Within a day, Ronald confessed to having committed the mass murder himself. He said, It all started so fast. Once I started, I just couldn't stop. It went so fast. That which he referred to as it, began around 3 in the morning at 112 Ocean Avenue. Ronald took his 35 caliber rifle and meticulously shot his two brothers, two sisters, mother and father. A bullet each for his siblings, double for his parents. Afterwards, Ronald drew a bath and redressed, disposed of his gun in the family swimming pool, then went to work as usual. It wasn't until later that day, around 6.30 in the evening, that Ronald announced the discovery of his slain family at the local bar. Ronald's story has altered many times since the cold-blooded happenings of that morning. The most well-known version of events was claims that he had killed his family due to demonic voices in his head. During his trial, Ronald's lawyer mounted a defense of insanity, which was supported by a court psychiatrist. Regardless, the final judgment found Ronald both guilty and aware of his actions, resulting in him being sentenced to six consecutive life sentences. In the years that have followed, Ronald has claimed that he was under the influence of drugs and alcohol when he performed the murders. In another version of the story, it was his sister, Dawn, who was the murderer. Ronald only killing her in the struggle which broke out upon the discovery of his dead family. His story has changed so many times that the only truth which we can now be certain of is that Ronald DeFeo Jr. is a notorious liar. Indeed, perhaps the most demonic aspect of the Amityville murders is the imagination of the murderer himself. However, regardless of Ronald's testimonies, there are certain facts which make the case particularly strange. All of the victims were found lying on their stomachs with no signs of struggle. Toxicology reports have proved that no sedatives were used, and the police found no evidence of Ronald having used a silencer on his very loud lever-action rifle. How then did the DeFeo family remain asleep in their beds as Ronald killed them one by one? In the court transcripts, Dr. Howard Alderman, the medical examiner on the case, reveals that he was mystified as to how a single gunman could have committed the crime. In response, there have been several competitive theories, from the very earthly to the paranormal. However, none truly satisfies the question of how Ronald cocked and loaded and shot, cocked and loaded and shot again and again and again, murdering his entire family whilst they stayed sound asleep. A little over a year later, 112 Ocean Avenue, the scene of such ghastly murders, became home to a new family. The house, with all of its furnishings still in place, was bought by George and Kathy Lutz and their three children. Whilst aware of the events that had taken place there, the Lutzes were optimistic, describing the house as their dream home. 
they even erected a sign which named the house High Hopes. However, they would only inhabit the house for 28 days. They would end up being forced from its walls, running out in their nightwear, abandoning all of their possessions, never to return. The events that allegedly occurred during those 28 days have since become legendary. Many have claimed that the Lutzes fabricated the fantastical tale to make money. However, to stake all of one's possessions, reputation and livelihoods on the unlikelihood that someone will find your story interesting enough to write a successful book and produce a successful movie seems too ludicrous a gamble for even the most ambitious of risk takers. In addition, multiple sources have suggested that the Lutzes would have enjoyed only marginal profits from the Amityville horror franchise. In a 2002 interview, George Lutz named this figure as close to $300,000 after taxes and legal fees. By way of contrast, the 1979 Amityville horror film alone is reported to have grossed over $86 million in theatres. Skeptics have also argued that the Lutzes got into financial difficulties and needed a sensational story to rid themselves of the house. However, after just 28 days, it is unlikely that the Lutzes had the time to reach such a dismal point. Indeed, by the time that they fled, they had not even made their first mortgage payment. The Lutzes had no reasonable motive to concoct this tale. It was only in their eventual endeavour to exercise their home that reporters were able to gain access to the Amityville house and make its story famous. Therein lies the true horror of Amityville. When you listen to any of the Lutzes' testimonies, there is an inescapable sense that they believe what they are saying is the truth. It was on the very first day of moving into the house that the Lutzes began to feel as though something was not quite right. A family friend and local Catholic priest, Father Ralph Pecoraro, visited the house to perform a blessing. This was nothing unusual for a family of faith moving into a new home. George described what happened during one of his final interviews before his death in 2006. Whilst performing the blessing, the priest was left disturbed by a strange feeling that he got in one of the upstairs bedrooms. Pecoraro described the room to George, who told him that it would be a sewing room. The priest supposedly looked relieved, then said, that's good, as long as no one sleeps in there. Paranormal events began to unfold immediately. Within a week, Kathy's hand had been touched by something that we discussed and couldn't explain. It was just something unseen. We also had uh, hordes of flies that would appear within two rooms. And no matter how many times we would kill them, they would reappear. It wasn't in the water. The china itself turned black. And at first it was one bathroom and then another and then another. And then uh, telephone repairmen came three times because each time we would try and communicate with the priests, we would run into faulty connections. Repeatedly, noises would jolt the family from their sleep in the night. It was George in particular who reported the most disturbance. He described how he would hear the front door violently open and close, only to then investigate and see it locked, with the dog asleep in front of it. I heard what I could only describe as a marching band tuning up. And at one time, it had sounded like they had rolled up the carpet. There were so many footsteps down there. There was so much noise. And he go running downstairs to see what it is, or what caused this. And he gets to the landing halfway, and there's nothing. And the dog would be asleep. Paranormal investigator Ed Warren drew attention to how a lot of the activity would happen at around 3 o'clock in the morning the same time that Ronald DeFeo murdered his family. Kathy Lutz reported that she was lulled into a state of deep, contented lethargy by the house. She would never want to leave. Even the simplest of chores was too much for her. Others have even stressed how the house seemed to age Kathy, both mentally and physically. On the night that the family fled the house, George claims to have witnessed his wife transform into an elderly woman before his very eyes a visage which took several hours to wear off. By the time we left, we had lost a considerable amount of weight. Kathy was passing out quite regularly. I had lost over 26 pounds. Arguably, it is all too easy to dismiss the Lutz's story as make-believe. 
The level of detail in their testimonies makes their claims captivating, especially when one considers the consistency with which they maintain their story throughout their lives. A more recent documentary, filmed in 2012, after the deaths of both Kathy and George, has added further evidence and intrigue to the Amityville case. For the first time since the events of 1976, one of the Lutz children, Daniel Lutz, has come forward to discuss his childhood experiences. Daniel has corroborated his mother and stepfather's testimonies, whilst adding to them with his own experiences. One of the most traumatic events, which has haunted him since the day it occurred, was when he witnessed the door of the boathouse open and slam shut repeatedly and with great violence. The family dog, Harry, was profoundly disturbed, his pen being beside the boathouse. In an attempt to escape, he jumped over the fence of his pen, suspended above the ground by his lead, seemingly trying to hang himself. After rescuing the dog, it took Daniel and George great effort to close the door. It was at this point Daniel recalls one of the most bizarre aspects of his experiences at Amityville. During the interview, his own disbelief at what he saw, even many years later, is plain to see. Just by watching, you can see that Daniel knows what he is about to say sounds ridiculous. However, he says it all the same. What did you see? What was in the window? It would have been what looked like a cartoon character of a, uh, uh, an angry pig with, like, wolf-like teeth. When he and George went upstairs to investigate, they found a rocking chair moving back and forth by itself. Daniel has claimed that he was possessed by a powerful entity in the house. The following extract is taken from an interview and is in his own words. I just got in a fight with George about, I don't even remember anymore. So by the time I got to the second landing, I was projected up the stairs into the walls. And my mother was like 15 feet behind me. I know that the spirit of some other thing passed right through me. My mother was standing right there and she just broke down and cried. That was the most horrible thing she had ever seen. And I stand up and and my body starts like I no longer have control of myself. She jumps around in shock, like something just scraped her or touched her. And it entered me, through me. And if I have to describe what it felt like, it would be like the numbness after being shot. From somewhere in the room it said, it is you. It was like sub bass like a goggle and a crackle to it. That stuck with me for at least a decade on a daily basis. Even after leaving the Amityville house, Daniel was sent to a Catholic monastic school by his parents. There, the priests performed ritual exorcisms for a year to rid him of the demon which had possessed him in the house. On the last night the Luxes spent at Amityville, the two boys and Kathy were lifted up on their beds by some unseen force. Daniel has described how he was terrified as the headboard of his and his brother's beds smashed against each other and the ceiling. They were trapped on the beds as they levitated. This was the final straw for the family. They could take no more. After 28 days living in a perpetual state of terror, the Luxes called Father Pecoraro, who advised that they leave the house and spend the night elsewhere. In their night clothes, they left. Whilst away from the Amityville house, the realization that they needed help to cleanse the house dawned on George and Kathy. So, it was in the March of 1976 that psychics, paranormal researchers and a Channel 5 news crew were allowed access to 112 Ocean Avenue. Amongst the investigators were Ed and Lorraine Warren. During the initial investigation, Lorraine was repulsed by one of the rooms, later discovered to have been the bedroom of Ronald DeFeo. Lorraine believed that while several spirits roamed the house, there was one particular entity which was both of greater power and greater malevolence than the others. Mm -hmm. uh, when we went into the house that day, we didn't realize that it was diabolically infested. This case had everything. It had the monstrosities of the night, 
which roamed that house, which infested it, which caused a young man to murder his whole family. The Amityville case affected our personal lives more than any case we ever worked on. It was the Warrens photographer who captured the infamous image of a spectral child in the doorway. Some have speculated that this is the ghostly presence of the youngest member of the family to be murdered in 1974, John Matthew DeFeo. However, lots of criticism surround the paranormal investigations that took place in the aftermath of the Lutz's 28 Days of Hell. Certainly, it is worth mentioning that the Channel 5 news crew did not pick up anything strange on film. Since the Lutzes, there have been no reports of any further paranormal activity at the Amityville house. The lack of subsequent hauntings, combined with the heavy reliance on eyewitness testimony, has given much credence to the belief that the Amityville horror was an elaborate hoax. However, Daniel Lutz, now an adult, tells another tale, one that he was denied the chance to tell when the event occurred. He states that all the hauntings happened and were triggered by George Lutz. Despite denials during his lifetime, Daniel asserts that George was a man who enjoyed to dabble in the occult. I think somewhere along the line that the George's beliefs and practices and things that he was directly involved with triggered and was a catalyst to what was going on in the house. And it was kind of like a magic trick gone bad that you couldn't shut off. Daniel also states that George was an abusive stepfather and the catalyst that led him to leave home at the age of 15. It is interesting that Daniel would corroborate the story of a man who both personally repulsed him and abused him as a child. Could this, then, be the explanation? Certainly, that the haunting seemed to stop after the Lutzes left Amityville can be explained by George's personal connection to the activity. What is more, one has to wonder why he would keep all of the material possessions of those who had died in the house before him. Could it be that, as a dabbler in the occult, George knew something of the alleged power of death and blood? Perhaps George Lutz had attempted to tap into this energy. However, rather than harness the residue that had been left behind by the murdered souls of the DeFeos, George disturbed something darker. He unleashed demonic forces which he could not control upon himself and his family. Such an explanation is a concurrent theme in poltergeist activity. There is always someone involved in occult practices who acts as a trigger. In the case of the Enfield poltergeist, it was young Janet Hodgson who played with Ouija boards. Could something similar have happened at Amityville? Furthermore, if this was the case, was this malevolent entity a new energy? Or had it been there all along, and part of the explanation behind the mystifying nighttime mass murder of the sleeping DeFeos. Unfortunately, all we can do is question. With the death of George Lutz, we shall never know the secret behind his alleged covert interest in the occult. And so, with the lack of any physical evidence, and the over-dependence on testimony, it is probable that we will never know for certain the truth behind the Amityville horror. If you enjoyed this video, Please leave a like and remember to subscribe for more of the paranormal. When it comes to poltergeist activity, there is none more famous than the case of the Enfield poltergeist. Between the years 1977 and 1979, Peggy Hodgson and her four children, Margaret, Janet, Johnny and Billy, were allegedly haunted by at least one malevolent entity 